It'll be in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 tonight. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It's going to take a few minutes tonight. Uh, I was, this week I was debating, um, I had two sermons in mind for, uh, for tonight. Um, and a lot of times, as a preacher can tell you, you don't know what the Lord wants me to preach until right in the nick of time. <laughs> um, and uh, I was working on, uh, working on, like I said, a couple different ones. And I uh, had the outline for this one I'm going to preach tonight uh, finished last night. I just had to flesh out a couple details. And then I got there this afternoon to, uh, to go finish it. And the whole thing had gone away. <laughs> uh, as things are like that are wont to do. Uh, so... Praise the Lord, I could tell people were praying for me because I was able to get that, and I think it came out, hopefully, and Lord willing, better than it was originally. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to get a few minutes tonight to brag on our Savior, Amen. just to just to talk about what a Savior we have. Amen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. Thank you for uh, calling me to do so. Thank you for just... Uh, uh, using me, Lord, the way you've seen fit. God, uh, you've, you've done things in my life already that I never would have thought I would have done, but uh, thanks to you, Lord, you're, uh, you, you've seen fit to, to use me this way. Lord, I thank you for that, and just thank you for the opportunity. God, I pray that this would be a blessing to those who came out, those who are here. Lord, help us to just to be attentive uh, to your words and Help us to, to think on these things throughout the week and just to remember how great a Savior we have, Lord. God, I pray that you would uh, come back soon, Lord, and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who started it all. He's the one who's going to finish it all. Uh, you know, and the biblical picture of the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, is very, very different from the world's view. Uh, and it has been that way all throughout history. You have these, these Catholic paintings of Christ. And uh, you ask the average man on the street, you know, what his, you know, his idea of Christ would be. Uh, many folks say he's, he was a way shower. Many folks say he was a good teacher, philosopher. Uh, those who are being generous would say he's a prophet. Um, and then their, uh, their, their image of Christ is one who... You know, the, he looks like he just got done filming a Pantene commercial. You know, he's, he's got the long reddish locks. So you see him doing that. Uh, he's, he's got his hands that are just so smooth and so nice and perfect. Looks like he never worked a day in his life. Uh, he's just, he's got this look on his face like he's, like he's Droopy the dog from the cartoons. Just so, so sad. And that's not how it is at all. Jesus Christ was a man's man. He's, uh, he's someone to look up to. They make him out to look like he wouldn't hurt a fly, but that's not the case. Uh, the, the biblical portrait of the Lord is, is very different. He, he grew up in a carpenter shop. He grew up from a young boy. Joseph, his stepfather, was a carpenter. He built houses and furniture for a living. Uh, he, had, you know, he, he knew what work was. Uh, he, despite the fact that he is God in the flesh... All powerful, he exercised restraint all his life. He he grew up as as a little boy. Now look at my son Henry. I just imagine, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ had to go through those same phases. He was a toddler at one time. God Almighty was born as a baby and grew up, uh, 
Luke 2, 49 and 51 says, and, and he said unto them, how is it that you saw me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? This is after he's been, uh, he stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents go a couple days journey without even realizing he was missing. And then they come back and they're searching everywhere for him. They thought he was with uncle so-and-so. They thought he was with aunt Susie. He wasn't anywhere in the caravan. And then they go back to Jerusalem all the way back at the backtrack a couple days and there he is in the temple just having conversations and dissertations with the religious leaders of his day. He was a 12-year-old boy. And he says, and he said unto them, How is it that you saw me? Wished ye not that it must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these, thing, all these sayings in her heart. He obeyed what his parents told him to do. He, God Almighty... The one who created the universe, uh, the one who was holding Mary and Joseph's breath in his hands, right. took this. Sub, uh, he was subject unto them. He placed himself under their authority, and he went and he he did his chores like he was told to. He went and took the trash out. He he helped his father in the carpenter shop, like I, like I said before. Right. He he knew uh, what what work was, and he knew uh, how to be a man. He. Uh, when it came time for him to begin his earthly ministry, he wasn't like one of those TV preachers we were talking about this morning. He wasn't, he wasn't going around with his chest puffed out and his fancy robes and saying, give your money to me or else you're not right with me. You know, give your, all, all that you have and give it to me. His disciples weren't going around with these, uh, all the trappings of, of, of high society lifestyle. Uh, no. Matthew 8, 19 to 20 says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. So he was expecting that. He, he thought, you know, I'm going to get in on this. But Jesus, in verse 20, And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He was homeless. You know, if you, he was going around living off the kindness of those who, who wanted to be kind to him. Those who worked, those who followed him and served him. He was staying in friends' houses. And uh, he didn't walk around puffed up and proud. When he healed people, he told them to keep it quiet. Yeah. He, he didn't magnify himself. Matthew 8, 2-4 says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. That's that faith we were talking about this morning. He, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Now think about that. A leper, the outcast of society, for good reason. You can't have those people in, in, in amongst the crowd because everybody's going to be lepers. Uh, they were commanded by law to put them outside the gates. But he comes up to Jesus and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus didn't... <clears throat> no, he didn't touch him like that. He, he didn't just speak the word as he did with other people. The Lord could have told him from a distance. All right, you're clean. Right. No, he, he, he touched him. Put his hand on his shoulder. And everybody around him shocked. And they're like, oh man, he's going to die. He's, he's, now we can't be around him anymore. He's been exposed. No, he just put his hand on his shoulder and he says, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. He says, don't, don't broadcast what just happened. Keep this between you and me. Keep this on the down low. Go, go show yourself to the priest and bring the sacrifice just like the law commanded. He wanted it to, you know, to make it seem like he had just been healed naturally of his, of his disease. Anybody, any one of us, any other religious leader would be like, and make sure you tell him who sent you. No, he was humble. He was lowly and meek. This is the man that we, where that's being spoken of in our text, the author and finisher of our faith. Look what he did. Look at what he did for you in verse two. He endured the cross. The Lord knew exactly what was going to happen to him at his death. He, he wasn't in the dark about anything. He knew every detail. What was going to happen? He grew up in Roman occupied Nazareth in Galilee. He saw executions all the time. He had to have. That's the common way that they put criminals to death. Right. 
He had to walk, you know, they, like preacher said before, they, he, they put him on the side of the road for everybody to see, for examples. So the Lord had seen crucifixions before. He'd seen a bunch of them. He probably knew exactly what kind of wood they used, being a carpenter. He, he, he was, no, was no stranger to that idea. So he knew what was going to happen to him, but he still he set his face like a flint, and he just went through. He, he endured it. He was well aware of what a criminal went through when he was crucified. John 12, 27 to 33 says, Now is my soul troubled, Jesus, Jesus Christ speaking, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? He says, what am I going to do? Ask, ask my father to not let me go through with it? No, he says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. This is the whole reason why I'm here. In verse 20, he says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. He said that, with, why would he say, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me? Not, o- not only did he know about crucifixion, everybody else knew about crucifixion. That was a common thing. And so that signified what death he should die. He's the one that said it. He knew ahead of time what was, hap- was going to happen. Right. If you knew something horrible was going to happen to you, something horrible, painful, awful, nothing, nothing anybody should ever go through, if you knew that was coming down the road for you, and you knew when it was going to happen, and you knew how it was going to happen, would you go through with it? If you didn't have to? That's the thing. The Lord didn't have to do anything. The Lord didn't have to go through what he went through. Uh, you'd scramble to find any way out of it. You'd, you'd scramble to find any excuse, any, any way to get around it to cheat death, what was going to happen to you. Christ was fully aware of what was in store, but he faced it head on. And the average criminal facing crucifixion was not subjected to, to all that the Lord Jesus Christ went through at the crucifixion. Not every criminal was beaten within an inch of his life first. Not, the criminals were just hauled out from the cell, dragged over there, and just nailed up. and just left. And that was, They were completely fine other than the fact that they were crucified right. and nailed up there. And that was a slow, painful death. Sometimes it took days. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ knew all the extra stuff that he was going to go through with that. The beating, the scourging, the mocking. He knew all of that, aside from the crucifixion part. And he still went through with it. Uh, Look at Matthew 26, 59. Look look there. Matthew 26, 59. Excuse me. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. He's already been betrayed. They've already arrested him. They've hauled him into the hauled him into the, the temple there, and they're looking for witnesses against him. They're trying, to, they're trying to scramble to find somebody who will testify against him. That shows you how crooked this was. Uh, and he says, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. See, they had already, a bunch of people, you know, came through and, and lied about it and said outlandish things. Uh, but everybody knew that those were lies. It was obvious that those were false witnesses. Like, we're trying, to, we're trying to condemn this man. Don't just lie. Don't just make stuff up about him. But the last, it says, in the last came two false witnesses and said, uh, let's see, two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power 
and and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then they didn't immediately just go and deliver him over to Pilate. No, it says, verse, uh, verse 67, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? So immediately they, start, they just start beating him. They start punching him. Uh, he, uh, verse, uh, come to Luke, or right, you have to turn there, but Luke twenty two sixty three 63 says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously, blasphemously spake they against him. He never opened his mouth in protest. Those, Roman, those, those, those soldiers, they played a game with him. They said, oh, this man's a prophet. Ah. So they put a blindfold on him and started punching him out. And they start spitting in his face. And they start smacking him and say, prophesy, who, who was it that just hit you? Who was it that just hit you? Who was that? Now, he could have told them the rank, name, serial number, birth date, their parents' names, where they grew up. He could have said all that right. to each one of them who hit him. But he didn't, know, he didn't open his mouth. He endured it. He was, not only was he just, not only is he beaten, he was scourged. That goes above and beyond a beating. That goes above and beyond uh, a whipping. Matthew 27, 22. Come to there. Matthew 27, 22 says, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. There's another passage where he said, you know, he went and scourged him. He's thinking, okay, well, he's, I don't want to put him to death. He's an innocent man. If they see a little blood, maybe they'll be pacified. And we'll have to go through and put this guy to death. So they, he delivers him out to scourge him. So they take him out and they whip him. And they, they took whips like cat of nine tails. You all see one of those where it's got a handle and then it's got a bunch of whips coming off of it. And in each strand, they're sewn in. There's, there's pieces of rock. There's pieces of shards of bone and glass. All of that. And when, when somebody gets hit with that, it doesn't bounce off. It sticks. And when he gets hit, it sticks. And then they have to rip that out. Every, every whip. Scourging. Uh, there's 39 stripes. Save one. Right, bro? 39 times. And it would stick and then rip it out. I'm trying to be gross. I'm just trying to paint the picture. Every 39 times, he was beaten within an inch of his life. Uh, he was beaten so bad, you could see his bones on his back. Psalm 22, 17 says, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. That word tell is an old English term for count. He can count his bones. He was literally beat to the bone. Other men who received scourging on a, as a punishment, a lot of times they die just from that. Imagine all the blood loss, the pain, you just pass out. You know, that's inhuman. That's a death sentence in and of itself. But he went through it. He never said a word in protest. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He just took it. He just let it happen. He looked ahead and saw the prize waiting for him, and he endured all the torture. What was that prize? It was you and I. That prize was saving us. 
That's right, brother. Amen. Now look at yourself. And, and, and as good as you can be, you're still worthless. Right. Amen. All our righteousness is filthy rags. Right. He knew what he was getting, but he still went through and endured all that. And then uh, after all the beating and the scourging, he was crucified. John 19, 16 says, they, Then delivered he, them, or delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of his skull, which is in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side. Uh, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. After all that, they've, they've plaited a crown of thorns on his head. They've mocked him. They said, hail, king of the Jews. And these Roman soldiers knew they're, they're just making sport. And after all that, his back's in ribbons. They put this cross on him, this heavy wooden plank. And they make him carry that all the way through the streets of Jerusalem, all the way out outside the city to Calvary, the public execution spot. Right on the side of the road where everybody can see. They stripped his clothes off. He was ashamed. But he still went through it. He still endured it. They get to... He had a, a fellow named Simon helping him carry his crosses because he was so weak from the, from the beatings. But he gets up to Calvary and he gets to the spot. They say, all right, stop here. And he, he lets that heavy cross off of him and it falls... Thunk. And coming with it, you know, all the rough wood just coming off of his back that was already in ribbons. And uh, what happened next shocked those soldiers. They'd never seen anything like this before. He just, he, he got down on his knees. He laid down, just laid on his back on the cross. He didn't struggle. They didn't have to fight him. They were expecting to fight. They had a band around them to, to, because they were used to that. Used to criminals trying to flee. But he just laid down. He just laid down on his own. He laid his hands out. And he, laid, he put his feet down together. Because he, again, he saw how it was supposed to go. He knew how it was supposed to go. He just lays down on his own. Nobody had ever done that. As they hammered those nails into those perfect hands and feet. And again, no scream of protest. Back in the garden when, when uh, Peter drew his sword to defend him, he said, put your, put your sword into your sheath. Know you not that I can call ten legions of angels? A legion, that's a thousand. Ten legions of angels. One angel, as you know, in the Old Testament, wiped out 185,000 men in one night. Without making a sound, because all those other the other army had was sleeping, they just slept through it all. One hundred eighty-five thousand men just, and then can you imagine what ten thousand angels would do? They destroy the world. They just wipe every single person off the face of the earth. Lord, could you just start it over? He could have just started over if he wanted to, and he would have been right in doing so. We deserved it. He could have just he could have either done that or he could have just gotten up and brushed himself off. He would have been fine and just walked through the midst of them. And nobody could have laid a finger on him. Right, There's another passage in the Bible where they wanted, the Pharisees wanted to, to shove him off a cliff. And it says he just walked through the midst of them. I don't know how he did it. If he literally walked through them, because he's God, he can do anything. Yeah. If he walked through them or... If he just looked at him and he stopped and they parted ways and just let him walk through. He could have done that. He could have healed himself like that, just gotten up and left to preach another day. But no, he endured the cross. Now that's just the physical aspect. The second thing I want to say is he despised the shame. The physical aspects of the Lord's death are horrific. But they pale in comparison to what he went through spiritually. Yes. Years ago, there's a fellow who uh, came out with the movie Passion of the Christ. And uh, he, I'll give him that he did a good job of 
of nailing the physical aspect. He got that down pretty good. But no movie camera can picture, can, can pick up what was really going on. Unbeknownst to the crowd, the soldiers and the, the mourners, there was a spiritual battle taking place. There was a battle like none had ever been fought before. As the Pharisees were smacking him and spitting in his face before he got to the cross, before the beating, when the beating started, Satan was in there in his ear. And he was whispering. He says, just give up. You don't have to do this. You're, you're God. I admit, you're God. You don't have to do this for them. They're not worth it. They really aren't. You can just stop now. You can just walk away. But he didn't. Behind the scenes, when he was on the cross, and the devils were celebrating, they were, as far as they knew, they were killing God's son. They were winning. Psalm twenty-two, twelve says, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped on me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Now, there were no bulls around the crucifixion. There were no lions there. That's spiritual. While he's on the cross suffering God's wrath, those devils are, are there cheering and jeering and just mocking him. It says they gave on me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. They're hurting him spiritually. They're just adding on to it. Despite the devils mocking and jeering him, his disposition, it wasn't that of a defeated man. It wasn't that of, of, of a suffering poor criminal. No. His disposition was that of a conqueror. Right. While he was suffering all that. Isaiah 50, look at, come to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. His disposition is that of, bring it on. I can take this and more. Whatever you've got. He's, as Satan's telling him, just give up, they're not worth it. He says, I know they're not. But I love them. And I'm going to save them from you. Amen. Amen. So bring it on. Amen. That's our Savior. Amen. All that aside, while he was on the cross, he, he, he drank the cup of God's wrath on sin. Yes, sir. The most horrible thing about Calvary wasn't the, wasn't the physical torture he went through. It wasn't the mocking and the shame and the spitting. It wasn't the devils jeering and mocking him. It wasn't them telling him to give up. No, it was between him and the Father. Everybody else was just noise. Everybody else, he could have cared less about whatever, what the devils were doing. He could have cared less about what the, what the Roman soldiers were doing, gambling for his clothes at the foot of his cross. No, there was a transaction between him and the Father, him and God. That cup that he prayed in the garden that the Father would remove from him, that's what, that's what he didn't want to go through. Like I said, he could have cared less about the physical aspect. Didn't hurt him. I mean, it hurt, but he could have taken all that and more. Nobody can kill God. He laid down his own life voluntarily. If he wouldn't have done that, they would have been there. They would still be there. Amen. But it's that cup that he had in the back of his mind. All through his ministry, all through his life, he knew that that cup was there. It was his own cup. He's God. He knows the wrath that God has on sin. 
Psalm 75, verse 8. It says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out, the, out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. That's God's wrath on sin. God can't abide sin. He can't let sin into his presence. He, he won't. And that wrath had to be pacified by somebody. Matthew 26, 39 says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He says, Is there no other way? Is there not a way out of this? You just imagine the Father saying, There is, but they won't be saved. He says, Lord, Father, is there... Is there let this cut pass from me. I'll go, through the, I'll go through the death. I'll go through the spitting and the beating and the scourging. It's not that cup. I know what's in that cup. And the Father again said, you don't have to do it. I'm not going to make you do it. But if you don't do it, you're not going to save him. And he drank that cup. He went through with it. Down to the dregs, like the Bible says. Lord Jesus Christ took all of God's wrath against sin on himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, just so that we could be sin free. Just so that we could have eternal life in heaven. He became sin. Personified. Right. You can't wrap your mind around that. The horror of Calvary wasn't the physical torment. The, the true horror of what the Lord went through for you and I is that He became sin personified. He who had never sinned before. He'd never had a dirty thought. He'd never stolen. He'd never slacked off in His work. And it's not that nobody caught Him. No, He just didn't do it. He lived a whole life, 33 years, 33 and a half years on this earth, Having a human nature like you and I, being tempted to sin every day of his life. But because he's God, he said no. He never had a dirty thought. He, he, never, he never felt that guilt that's associated with sin. We're used to it. We're used to it because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ had a pure conscience. He had never known the sting of guilt, but he took the guilt of every sin that had ever been committed by everyone who's ever lived, present, past, future. He took the guilt for every sin on himself. All of a sudden, without any prior knowledge of what that's like, all of a sudden he's guilty of everything. Mark 9, 43 says, And if thy hand offend, this is Christ preaching, and he says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into the life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, into, in, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Uh, in hell, in the heart of the earth right now, the souls that are there still have their humanity. They still have their, their human nature, so to speak. They can, still, they can feel pain. They can... They can have a rational thought they can regret but in the lake of fire that soul loses its humanity it becomes a worm look at uh, Psalm 22 6 says but I'm again prophecy of Christ on the cross he says but I'm a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people we gloss over that but according to that verse he suffered in three short hours on the cross, he suffered what a lost soul in hell, and a lost soul in a lake of fire, suffers for eternity. And even in hell, a lost man experiences the presence of God. 
Uh, Psalm 139, 8 says, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God, God's presence is still felt by those souls down in hell right now. But in the lake of fire, not only is there pain and torment, but after the great white throne judgment, God condemns those lost souls that are in hell to an eternity in the lake of fire. And he experiences true separation for the first time. In his existence. Yeah. You've never known what true separation from God is like. You couldn't subsist if you were separated from God. But on the cross, Christ said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced what a man suffers in the lake of fire for eternity. And he paid for all of that, for every sin that's ever committed or ever will be committed, in three short hours. Just took three hours. And he, experienced, he paid the price for all sin. So a lost man condemned to hell, a lost man is condemned for hell for one sin. Uh, it's not murder. It's not lying. It's not blasphemy. It's one sin. A man in hell is not paying for every sin he ever committed. Those have already been paid for. Those have already been paid for. God is not going to make him pay again. A lost man pays for the sin of unbelief. He pays for rejecting that sacrifice that was made. A lost man will uh, suffer an eternity just paying for that one sin. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ suffered what a lost man suffers over an eternity in the lake of fire, but not just for one sin. He didn't just pay for the sin of unbelief. He paid for every lie, every murder, every dirty thought, every blaspheming word, every idle thought. All of that, he paid for it. And he completed that payment. A lost man is never going to be able to look God in the eye and say, this one you didn't, you didn't take care of. No, he, I, he paid it all. Amen. John 19, 29 says, Now therefore was a vessel, uh, vessel full of vinegar, and they, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon his hip and put it to his mouth. Because the Lord is on the cross and he said, I thirst. So to, to add insult to injury, instead of giving him water, they give him vinegar. Right. It makes you more thirsty. It dehydrates you. And putting vinegar on those bloodied and cracked lips, just adding pain on pain on pain. Uh, but he says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Amen. He said, it is finished. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. This isn't a sacrifice that you have to repeat over and over. This isn't a sacrifice that wasn't complete. Hebrews 10 verse 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. God has provided a way for you not to go to hell. He's provided the way for you not to spend that eternity in the lake of fire. Right. Just paying for the stupid sin of unbelief. He's given you a free way out. It's a get out of jail free card if there ever was one. Right. And all you got to do is accept that he paid it for you. Amen. Accept the fact that you weren't able to pay it on your own. Amen. If you could work your way into heaven, if you could be a good enough person to get there on your own, What's the point of all that? Amen. What's the point of all the torture? What's the point of all the spiritual degradation? What's the point of all the, the wrath that was shown? Yeah. Amen. Or Because if you could just be a good enough person, even if you could just get the Bible by the skin of your teeth and barely get there, you could say for eternity, hmm, I got myself here. No. Your salvation was paid for at one time. At one place, by one man. Amen. What a Savior. Amen. What a Savior. Preacher, when you come in.